presentation. Um, I want to just say, uh, Gil, thank you so much. I wrote down several things, including we must serve as guideposts. So thank you so very much. Our distinguished panel uh, to respond as discussants include Dr. Tracy Cross, who will be leading the panel. He was our 2020 Palmarium Award recipient and the Jody and Leighton Smith Endowed Professor of Psychology and Gifted Education and the Executive Director of the Center for Gifted Education at William and Mary. Dr. Cross is a past president of the National Association for Gifted Children. And we also have Dr. Joy Lawson Davis. Oh, pleased to have Dr. Davis Lawson Davis as part of our discussants. She is a career educator with over 40 years experience as a practitioner, scholar, author, and consultant, including five years as the Virginia State Specialist for K-12 Gifted Services and higher education expertise as chair of the Department of Teacher Education at Virginia University. Diversity education and gifted education are Dr. Lawson Davis's areas of special expertise. Welcome, Dr. Lawson Davis. And we also have Dr. Stephen Chow, a licensed clinical psychologist in private practice who leads the San Francisco Bay Area's Summit Center's training and research programs, overseeing and supervising doctoral and master's level students and conducting research within the field of giftedness and twice exceptionality. Dr. Chow is a past board member of SANG, supporting emotional needs of the gifted. So it is my pleasure to turn the evening over to Dr. Cross. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate uh, and enjoy any opportunity I can to to be a part of Norma's uh, conference. It's something that an awful lot of my friends and colleagues look forward to every year. So uh, thank you for including me. As uh, Norma mentioned, I'm I feel very fortunate and humbled to have received this award last year, and it's something that I reflect on pretty regularly. is is something I'm very proud of. Thank you for inviting me back to have a chance to listen to, learn from, and think about some of the things Dr. Whiting spoke to this evening and to provide a response that I hope has some value in this context. I'm uh, honored to be on the same uh, dais, so to speak, with Dr. Davis and Dr. Chow. Uh, I look forward to hearing their comments as well. I've taken about six pages of notes which I'm not going to go, try to go through. I do want to mention one of the ironies in life is a way to get started here. Um, I ordered a new pair of lenses for my glasses after having an exam a few weeks ago, and they came in last week, so I was very excited and I went to have them put in, but it turned out they were the wrong ones, so they had to be reordered. And it didn't dawn on me until today when they called me to tell me that my lenses were back that I could, uh, in having them put into my glasses, that there might be an adjustment period. So right now, no matter how much I squint, lean forward, uh, look out of one eye, I cannot make out the pictures of my colleagues on the screen. I certainly can't read my six pages of notes, so I'm gonna do the best I can. These little absurdities of life though are, are funny. First, let me mention that uh, Dr. Whiting was gracious enough to come and uh, present for us, uh, Wave and Mary, for a critically important project that we've been working on with our friends from the Roper School uh, and our friends from the Detroit Public Schools now for several years. I've been involved with the Roper School for the better part of 40 years now, uh, and their commitment to equitable educational practices and, and so forth have really impressed me. And it's one of the reasons why I've stayed involved. Uh, Lori Lutz, who is an attorney by trade, a civil rights lawyer, um, 
is a very uh, a key member of the Roper team. And so she hosted a symposium a few years ago at the Wayne State Law School that uh, we were a part of. And so we've been working together with the teachers of the Detroit schools for several years now. And it's just been an honor, uh, obviously a learning experience, but it's, it's uh, very much about trying to help children who have sometimes been looked past, but sometimes they've been tripped up and pushed down the stairs, in my opinion. And we're just there to try to do our small part. Uh, so uh, Dr. Whiting was good to come and speak to our faculty and staff, the faculty at the Detroit schools and the Roper schools and our staff who are working with the grant. So I've gotten to listen to him speak and uh, appreciate and am a bit humbled by the extent to which he can manage so many different complex tasks during the same presentation. I think I've finally graduated from uh, two PowerPoint slides. I think that's probably my next quest in my career as a professor. Well, I wanted to just make a few comments now. And uh, my understanding is that each of the three of us will speak a few minutes um, and then we'll come back for a summary. So a few comments. I wanna start with the end though. And the end is of late, I've been receiving a lot of criticism. And at first I didn't like it because I wasn't used to it and I didn't enjoy it. Uh, but then I realized, well, I'm being criticized for the right things. It, it suggests to me that maybe some of the points that we've been trying to make over the years uh, are finally getting the attention of some of the people who, I'm going to call him Gilman, who Gil made uh, reference to. For example, you can't assume that everything is independent of each other. For example, his, his time spent tonight talking about the eugenics movement and some of the significant players, not only in history, but in gifted education history and what they were emphasizing in those days and the extent to which that became uh, perhaps the most widely used tool that became the most widely used conception of giftedness for the past hundred years. Even today, in certain circles, I will hear people say things like, unless you use an IQ test, then you can't really know if the child is truly gifted. That little word truly is such an interesting word that's widely used to, to conceal some of the things that Gil talked about tonight. Truly giftedness, needing to come from one test. I wrote a paper with my wife Jennifer a few years ago for the Roper Review in response to Bob Sternberg's most recent theory about wisdom and in it, I compared intelligence testing and the uh, sort of military industrial complex of that phenomenon to uh, cars and how similar to me, the evolution of cars from the early Model T days to what we have today and how their histories are remarkably similar. And that it's not that I don't think that cars have no utility it's just that we're, we're on the brink of some really extraordinary changes in cars. Uh, one of the cars we have in our family, my wife drives is a plug-in hybrid and get 150 some odd miles to the gallon, something not even imaginable not long ago. But I understand from recent reports from the major auto companies that they're all supporting President Biden's efforts to move to electric cars away from petroleum-based cars. They see that as the absolute future and only in about two decades. That's remarkable. That is the kind of change that I think Gilman is talking about that's needed in the field of gifted education. Not incremental changes, not changes around the edges, but changes that just completely um, cause us, force us to rethink the assumptions that we've had for many years about what giftedness is and what it isn't. I happen to live in a little town called Williamsburg, Virginia. And one of the things I'm proudest of is that uh, a young woman named Gabby Gifford lives about seven or eight miles from my home. And I take great pride in her accomplishments. Uh, a young woman who was the best gymnast in the world uh, and still is among the most elite gymnast in the world. And uh, that kind of performance and capacity comes from unbelievable degrees of practice and teaching 
and effort and failure and talent, a whole, whole uh, ingredients list. And while I suppose it would be helpful if she had a high IQ score, research hasn't really supported that it's correlated more than moderately with several of, our, of other talent domains other than say possibly uh, performance in school and academic endeavors. So here's Gabby Gifford now. She is an exceptional person. You can listen to her and talk to her in five minutes and you know that. But being, world, being the best in the world at something ought to teach us something. And our allegiance to a singular notion of intelligence is really crippling our field. I happened to come to the field because my family owned an art gallery when I was a young, young person, a child through adolescence. So I grew up just circled by artists. And one of the lessons I learned about artists, professional artists, is no two of them are very similar as people. Their personalities, their sensibilities, their skill sets, their approaches, their art, remarkably different. And while there are periods of recognizable forms of art, what I learned was that, that uh, part of being an artist was having a type of creativity that was uncommon to most people. Now again, perhaps being, having a high IQ test would have helped, help, help, help them in some form, but I don't think so. Now they ranged, they ranged in, in uh, what their interests were, how they lived their lifestyle, what they engaged in. Uh, they ranged quite widely on most things that people range in. So I never found that looking at art and knowing what the IQ score of the artist was to be particularly helpful to me. And I don't think it is to most people, quite frankly. So what the end that I said I want to start with is a paraphrasing of criticisms that I've received personally and that I've read generally by different people now, I come from a background in statistics and psychometrics. That was my original training. And so over the years, I, I try to flip that light switch on sometimes to make sure I can understand the arguments of people who hold such a strong allegiance to one test type or another. So one of the ways that, that I guess is sort of similar to the post-Oklahoma tragedies that Gil described was after the fact or after atrocities, we try to find language to use that makes it seem like what happened really wasn't that bad. So what is being used now as language to diminish the efforts to, to uh, prevent future examples of George Floyd's murder is to denigrate those of us who are looking to, to develop the talent of all children and for those who might have extraordinary capacity or potential, them too, is to say that if you don't kneel at the altar of the psychometric proof that we use of the reliability and validity of IQ tests, then you're only interested in things like equity. Well, you know what I say? I say, yes, I say, yes. Because if a test cannot be equitable for all, it cannot be equitable for anybody. And I'm not saying there can't be a role for tests. As a psychologist, I've used tests for 40 years, but I use them to help learn about children, not to keep them out of programs, not to label them as feeble-minded, not to find pernicious ways to hold them down. So, it's not necessarily that the test itself is the problem. It's how they are used and what people believe about them. So my, my truth at this point is um, that we have to reframe, as Gil said, and use a, not just a broader understanding, but an understanding that has a higher standard of equity uh, for all, because if we can't create a car that can move around the people who need it, then its value is greatly diminished. And I think that 
our whole field cannot fall prey to a singular equation. And for many years when I was in school and just out, my major professor who I greatly admire, we talked a lot about this notion of a true score, in this case, the intelligence that we think we're gonna measure with any form of test that we have at our disposal is equal to the score received plus error. And there's always error. So in my opinion, we spent a hundred years trying to reduce error, but we didn't look at what we're claiming to be the true score and whether that in fact is what, what the entirety of giftedness is. Now, perhaps we just ought to parse out intelligence and giftedness a little wider apart. And that intelligence as some people want to think of it in a fairly narrow way can exist in the world where giftedness exists. Because to me, giftedness is very much about what cultures define as important, important for moving their culture forward. And if tests don't yield equitable outcomes, then they're not beneficial to society. So it's time that we do better than we have. And again, uh, the only reason that I can even be this open-minded at this point in my career about the value of intelligence tests is because of some very well-known famous intellectuals who did great things, who attribute being found and given opportunities because as a young person, somebody thought they were able and gave them an intelligence test. Patrick, Daniel Patrick Moynihan is an example we often use in our field of someone who I understand grew up in a, an impoverished community, but a teacher found that he was quite exceptional. And after he was given intelligence tests, the school district looked at him differently. Well, hmm. I don't know that I want that option thrown out, but I darn sure don't want that to be the only option in. So I, I, I'm excited by Gilman's presentation because I think that what it means is the, that we're making enough noise and the circumstances are loud enough and there's enough, there's a critical mass now of people saying psychometrics matter. And anytime we build an instrument to measure anything, it ought to measure what we say and it ought to be reliable. But sometimes you have to go back to square one, maybe go back to Binet and just say, did we get away from what it was you originally intended? As Gil would have said, yes, we did. And as many others would say, yes, we did. What do we need to do? And again, there are people in the field who are making good efforts to this. And I think some of, of Robert Sternberg's efforts are intended to broaden to all people conceptions of giftedness, but there are many others out there. I, was, I have a good friend who, um, is in New Mexico uh, and she's uh, of Navajo descent. She was a public school teacher for many years. She has a PhD and is quite expert in gifted education. When we used to talk at tag board meetings about her life in the classroom for all those years with those children, uh, I asked her, well, what's been, the, what's been the thing that stood out to you to be your most difficult task? And she said, well, Tracy, something you may or may not be familiar with is that the children I serve have been raised. Their families do not believe in standing out through competition. They work collaboratively. They work as a community. They perform and, and, and thrive as a community. So many of the assumptions that I'm expected to base my instruction on, my assessments on, my teaching on, et cetera, really don't work well with the children I'm serving. I had to come up with new ways because the traditional forms of identifying them failed them. So right there is one really good robust example where if you don't know the nature of the people you're studying, you're gonna underestimate their capacity. Now, how many times do we need to learn that lesson and from how many different conditions? We're familiar with the study out of Australia where Ab Aborigines children were, were, were given different examples of like rocks, rocks that were a regular part of their world. And then other uh, white kids of Australia were asked to 
to study them too. And they were tested to see memory of placement and so forth. The short of it was the Aboriginal children just outperformed them to no end. The, the white kids had no familiarity with what they were doing. They held no meaning, no history. They had no cultural relevance. They were asked to do nothing. And then let me give you one final example. Um, I, I happen to work at the College of William and Mary. And William and Mary has a long history. Uh, it's about 327 years old. And it's, it's lived in different incarnations and there are many good things you can say about it. At one point in its history, there was a time when uh, some of the uh, indigenous groups uh, were forced to send children away from the communities to schools that were meant to, I think, homogenize them to make them more like the white folk of the day. And uh, so there was a meeting between a chief and uh, Franklin, and they talked about the value of the kinds of education that a person, that the children of the, uh, uh, of both groups would have if they spent more time in the presence of the other group. Now, generally speaking, I think that on the surface sounds reasonable, but the after, after uh, offering to the chief um, that uh, they would be happy to take some of the indigenous kids up to uh, different parts of the country and educate them properly, uh, the chief thought, Rather than do that, please send more of your students to live with us. Um, but the chief had to put a caveat on that because they found that the, the, when the children from the indigenous groups went and lived with white folk, when they came back, the chief said they weren't good for anything anymore. They didn't know how to hunt. They didn't know how to fish. They didn't know how to do any of myriad chores and necessary parts of the culture that kept the indigenous groups going. Now, all this was said in jest and very respectfully, but that was, I'm told, very, was a remarkable experience for uh, Franklin to hear that someone would resist the opportunity to be made more in their, in their uh, image. So culture matters. History matters, as, as Gil said. Goals matter. Treatment matters. Fairness matters. Equity matters. So let us create a science that helps reach those goals. And then let's call that gifted education. Until that time, I'm not certain exactly what we're doing. So I'll end with my baseball metaphor. I like to think about kids in schooling and sometimes gifted education as going to watch a baseball game. And if you start the game and you notice that one of the players is standing on third base, not the third baseman, but one of the other teams starts the game on third base. A player starts the game on second base. A player starts the game on first base. And then a, a player's about to bat. But with fingers clinging to the fence are a group of children of color children from poverty. Not are they not in the game. They don't even have, they have no bats. They have no equipment. They don't get to play. Now, I don't want to be a part of a field who gets excited every time a child from third base who starts life on third base makes it home. And there are some pretty well-known funding agents in our country that really like to, to uh, fund those kids from third base home. I, I imagine them having silk jackets with their foundation names on the back of them. So as the child about steps foot on third base, on, on the home plate, they put their jacket on their back to get credit for their performance. Let's all be equally committed to all those children so that they all have equal opportunity so that there's equity across the board. Until we do that, I'm not really certain what we're doing, but I so appreciate Gil's uh, discussion tonight and I look forward very much to Joy and Stephen's comments. So thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Dr. Cross. Um, we appreciate your comments and insights and um, you are certainly welcome to invite the next panelist to speak. Uh, let's see, I'm unsure of the order, but I believe, uh, Stephen, are you up next? That's what yes. I remember from my notes. So let me invite Dr. Stephen Chow to, to react to Gilman's uh, speech tonight. Thanks, Tracy. It's a, an honor to be on the panel with you as well as Dr. Joy, Sister Joy. And uh, I wanna say a thank you to DU, Norma, uh, Joy, thanks so much for inviting. Uh, Dr. Whiting's presentation um, ticked me off and uh, I wanted to say that in the most honorable way. And uh, yeah, am I ticked off by his presentation? Yes, I am. And I think that's a good thing. I think we should all be ticked off. The inequity that has come across and that is much more salient these days is a staunch reminder of what history presents to us. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. But uh, for Gil, what I wanna say is, is that I found him to be real. I saw him and Donna Ford long ago do a presentation and he still strikes me as a, as a remarkable person. Uh, again, he's real uh, and what a wonderful griot uh, that he was in presentation. Uh, embodying uh, so much. He remains a beacon, I think, and an enlivened model uh, in which to educate, inspire, and inculcate the philosophies of opportunity, diversity, and equity, and giftedness, and gifted education. I um, want to say that uh, the things that Gil talked about really that struck me. Um, his he began in the beginning of the presentation also with good trouble. And I think good trouble reminds me of uh, when I was in graduate school and engaging in multicultural psychology about difficult dialogues. And I think difficult, difficult dialogues are where we are at right now. A lot of things have been stirred up in society that Gil brought about uh, that are not new and that are historically embedded and for Gil to be able to, in this way, uh, bring about hist history and the roots of what had, had brought us to gifted education is really very salient. He talked about Terman, he talked about um, uh, eugenics and how that really shifts how gifted education is today. In psychology, it reminds me of the different theories that have come about. Uh, for example, psychodynamic theory, psychoanalytic cognitive behavioral therapy, narrative therapy. And the things that I teach my students about is, is that what they don't realize, what they, what they believe is, is that these are truths and end all be alls of how to help people. And I try to remind them, and I think one of the messages that are very important that Gil shared with us is, is that many of these have a root in a person or a group of people. And if you understand that person or that, that group of people that brought this about, really wonderful. And so not everyone gets along with everyone else and not everyone is good with everyone else. So. Does psychodynamic psychoanalytic therapy work with everyone? No, it doesn't. Does it work with a group of people? Yeah, it can be very good for a group of people. Same with CBT, same with uh, narrative therapy and so on and so forth. So, so it is true that IQ tests are, have come about in a particular way. Are IQ tests good for a group of people? Yes, they are. Is it good for all people? Not necessarily so. And also, is it good to utilize them in such a powerful way and irresponsibly, uh, in my humble opinion, to classify different people? I don't think that's, that's a good thing. So one of the things that has come about is, are the questions that we have to ask ourselves is, are these instruments, are the end all be alls of how we identify giftedness? I like Tracy, what you said that the um, maybe 
um, separating this idea of intellect with giftedness is a, perhaps a good way. It reminds me of decoupling or even defunding the way in which we, uh, in which we do our assessments. Uh, Gill referenced also the idea of not just quantitative measurements, but qualitative measurements. I think that's a really great mixed methodology approach uh, for identification. And really, uh, with all of these things that Gil shared with us about both history and what's occurring today uh, is, is something that I thought about and reflected upon that education is connected to and mirrors society. And so if we don't think about society and we, then we may not be able to provide the best education for our children and our children's children. Um, the other thing that Gil shared with us in his title is the idea of reframing. And Tracy, uh, I'm gonna joke with you a little bit about this because I actually thought when you were talking about your glasses, you were going exactly where I was gonna, what I was thinking about. So um, Gil said he was reframing for us some of the ways in which to look at history. And I think that that's true from a psychological pr perspective. However, I think Gil did something better than that, than reframing, which is that little shift. He gave us a different lens. And when you are able to look through a different lens, you look through the world in a, a, a grander way, I think. And Tracy, you said when you've got your lenses, there was an adjustment period to wearing your glasses. And I think when we look at these aspects of society and history, and understand the roots of where we come, it's very important for us to be okay with that discomfort and the ability for us to be adjust to the new lens in which we are looking at things. Uh, Norma also uh, said that she wrote something down and she, uh, and this was a, something I wrote down is, is that we have to serve as guideposts. And when we do that, I think we can not just learn about history and ask ourselves, what can we learn from history and from what perspective and what lens we're looking from. But when we learn about history, I think we learn about ourselves. And when we are face to face with our own selves and our own vulnerabilities, I think that's when we are best able to educate our children and our children's children. And isn't that what parenting is all about anyway? I, um, I also uh, wrote another thing down when Gil was talking, which is uh, he made me continually think that we cannot sweep things under the rug anymore. Uh, the concepts of racism and inequity are not just concepts, that they are real, that they are painful, violent, soul traumatizing and reverberate across the years and centuries until today, and they will uh, into the future. And what can we do about it? Are we impassioned enough? Are we ticked off enough? Are we moved enough to be able to make sweeping changes? These kinds of things have happened time and time again. And the, the, the thing that Gil said uh, was that he, I'm trying to remember something about the history that matters is the history we know. And if we only know history from a certain perspective, we don't know history very well. Uh, that's a great lesson to, to his daughter and to others and to us. And so when we understand history from multiple perspectives, I think we can make changes for all of our kids in a very equitable way. Um, thank you, Gil, also for providing hope through that, the anger and the, and the revolution. I think some of the panelists had, uh, the, the uh, members have commented on uh, in the chat room and, uh, and be, having this ability to paradigm shift allows us to shift mindset with emotion, with reasonability, with passion, 
and for us to keep going forward so that we can change the future for all. Thank you, Dr. Zhao. Uh, very interesting. I'm gonna take credit and pretend that my glasses story was intended to uh, be a part of my presentation rather than stalling. Uh, so if you found any uh, wisdom in it, then give me credit for it, please. You're a kind man, Dr. Zhao. Uh, I'd like to ask my friend, Dr. Joy Davis, to, uh, to speak with us for a few minutes. Tell us about what your thinking is tonight. Joe, you seem to be muted at this point. We still can't hear you. No. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm so sorry. Um, wow. Uh, of course, Gil, you you always uh, get us thinking. You always uh, get us feeling. And I and I um I have to say I, I kind of feel like Stephen. I um I'm 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 upset. I'm angry and I'm hurt. Um, I'm so hurt by what we're going through right now. Um, but my pain drives me. My pain keeps me motivated until we can see some difference in this field. Um, uh, I've been at this for a long time and I haven't seen the change come about that I know is necessary for the children that we serve. And like Tracy says, and Gil says, and Stephen says, we serve all of these children. We really don't have a right as a field to pick and choose who we want to serve and who we don't want to serve, whose parents uh, we can say yes to, whose parents we can say no to, which communities we want to get to know, which communities we, we don't want to know. Um, we, we don't have that right. And if we are setting ourselves apart as gifted educators or educators of the gifted, then we really have already placed ourselves in a position in a hierarchy that says that we know more, we should feel differently, we should do things better than everyone else. But we're not, we're just not. Because if we did, we wouldn't be here. We, uh, we may be here listening to Gil because he's just dynamic in his presentation of all the history and of all that we need to know in order to correct ourselves. But we wouldn't be having this same discussion um, here in the 21st century, uh, 20 years into the 21st century, by the way. Uh, we wouldn't be having the same discussion that we had um, in the 1960s, in the 1970s, in the 1980s. Uh, we, there were people who worked hard to help us to do better and to be better than we are today, but we're not there yet. Um, so that's disappointing to me. That is very, very disappointing. It makes me angry sometimes. Uh, I really do, I have to say, I get aggravated with people, uh, but then I stop. I take a deep breath and say, there's work to be done. This is important work. And it's not just about us and who we are, what our names are, and you know what we've already done with our lives. It's about those children out there, folks. It's about the kids who are popping up and cropping up everywhere in every community. And these kids need us to see them as intelligent, as creative, as compassionate. We need to see the potential in them to change their own communities, to change this world community that we live in. We, these kids are counting on us. Um, Gil said to us that we have to serve as a guidepost. We have to do what is just, humane, and moral as a field. We really have to, we don't have, again, we don't have a choice. Uh, I think that anyone who is involved and engaged in this particular field 
um, no matter what your, your orientation is, I think that if you are not about the business now of making gifted education a field that uh, symbolizes equity, a field that symbolizes equity, then you're in the wrong business. You're in the wrong business. We, we have to do better. And I think we can do better. Gil has set the frame here for us tonight. He's given us uh, a, hist a history lesson that uh, many of us were not as aware of and some who were aware didn't know all the details. He didn't leave anything out. And I thank you so much for, for that, Gil. I thank you for not leaving anything out. I thank you for telling uh, the story of the Wall Street massacre again. I thank you for sharing that with us. I thank you for sharing the origins of, of, of Lewis Terman's work and the damage that it did to the field. Not, not to celebrate Lewis Terman, but, but the damage that it did to the field, the, the, the homogeneous method of looking at children for, for what their intelligence is. And then, you know, just decide, we're gonna leave these kids out. Or we're going to put them into a package over here. They're going to sit in this box and that's where they're going to stay. And we, we're only going to deal with these students over here. I don't know how we can do it. I don't know how we can do it and say that we're doing what's best for everyone because we're not. And to say that we are who we say we are. I don't, I don't know how we can do it. Tracy raised a good point as well around cultural difference and, and, and Gil and throughout his message shared that with us as well. Every culture has its norms, its traditions, its values that uh, should be respected. And if by now in the 21st century, once again, we don't have enough sense and enough moral fiber to value and respect what each culture brings to the picture, then, then we're, we're way off base. We're way off base. I'm not, you know, I don't, yes, I do. I do mean to be critical. I think that we can do better. I think we should do better. I think that we need to sift out from among our own groups, our own group, those persons who don't understand and don't have any intention, you know? So yeah, we have a fight going on right now in gifted education. We have a fight going on. There, there's, a, there's a crew of people, a group of people who are hell-bent, hell-bent on keeping the intelligence test, that one way of looking at intelligence, that one way of looking at giftedness in, in our faces. They're hell-bent on ensuring that we use statistics and that we use the quantitative variables to, to see and to show why some students seem to be better than other students. They're just hell bent on doing that. So the rest of us who don't believe that, we have, we've got to be hell bent too. We have to be hell bent too. We have to say that equity is not a bad word. It's not a bad word. It, it, it is what we say we are, what we should be. It is the democratic way of looking at, at, at people. Equity is providing for students what they may not have had or not been able to, to have based on where they come from, who their communities are. But it's also looking at the beauty of who they are. It's also the beauty of who they are. We can do better people. We can absolutely do better. Recently, since the uh, pandemic, and I guess this happened with a lot of us now since we're doing everything virtually, since the pandemic and um, since the murder of George Floyd, I need, I have, I have been, um, you know, sitting here in my office um, and changed my office around a few times. And I've spent so much time here at this computer with school district personnel, state organizations, advocates, with parents, uh, with individuals from all across the country who are desperate for answers, desperate for answers, D desperate for people to come and help, desperate. And I believe that what has happened in our nation has, has really motivated people more. You know, we should be, you know, we should be again upset with ourselves because we, we're at this place. But this place is gonna, I think is gonna help us to do some things better. And, and I, I have to agree 
with Gil that this is a time that we can make a difference. We can do things differently. And um, I just, I'm so, I'm so excited about being able to join forces with so many people now, um, people who are within the organizations that I've been working through, people who are outside of the organizations and listening to the voices of all these people who believe what I believe, that these children have great potential and it's up to us to look for that potential, to look for that potential. It's up for us to do what we can to make their lives um, more equitable. It's up to us to, to, to take from the communities what we know about them. And if what we don't know, we need to learn more because there are people who can teach us. Their families and community members can teach us more about who they are. Consistency and being and doing this often is also critically important. Thank you for sharing that, Gil. We have to stay at this. We cannot stop. We have to keep pushing it. We have to keep helping people. We have to, you know, we have to keep putting this in folks' faces. Again, we've got to be brave and courageous and bold about it so that everyone understands that we're not going to quit. We're not going to give up. We're not giving in. Because once again, we're not just talking about our lives and the lives of the students who are with us now, but we're talking about the future of these communities, the future of this nation, the future of the world lies in our hands. And we have to take this seriously. We have to take this seriously. And I believe together we can do that. I'm very proud to be a part of, of this work. I'm very proud to, to be able to work with people like Gil, to, to know the work that's going on at the College of William and Mary. I'm proud to hook up with my buddy, Steve and Chow from time to time and do work across the country. I'm proud to be able to do this work, but it, it is painful. I have to say it's painful. Um, it's painful that we have to keep doing this, but I think that together we can. Gil, you are a supreme griot, and we thank you. We really thank you. I thank you for sharing and being so open about your concerns and being and doing it in such a way that I don't think many people will forget tonight. I don't think they'll forget seeing the images, and I don't think they'll forget listening to you draw analogies across and also taking us from a place where we, where we need to understand the history and the background better in order for us to move forward. Thank you for, for sharing. Thank you, Tracy, for being so cool and calm and giving us your stories as well. I really I always appreciate hearing from the different perspectives of so many different people. And if we can, if we can appreciate it among ourselves, then we need to also be the ambassadors, the, um, the, the guardians, the guideposts to help people see the same kinds of intelligence and creativity in the children that, that we serve all across the nation. Thank you so much, Norma, for inviting me, Joy, for giving us all that great information to help us stay on task uh, for this evening's uh, activities. Um, thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Um, I don't know if I can be heard just yet, but I am to do my best with the time remaining. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chow. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Whiting. I want to make a few points, if possible, in the remaining time. The first thing I want to say is this. I start virtually every presentation with the same PowerPoint slide or some version of it. I say that gifted children are the most heterogeneous group to study because they vary the most on the most number of variables. Makes them really hard to identify using limited efforts, but their diversity is just remarkable. On almost any indicator you wanna think about in terms of what we might measure, they vary. So they're very difficult to stereotype which is a wonderful thing, and yet we found a way to do it. Mm. For, nine, for nine years, I worked as the executive director of the Indiana Academy for Science, Mathematics, and Humanities, which is a residential high school for gifted kids. 
And I would literally spend four to five hours of virtually every workday, I know, best job in the world, talking with and listening to high school juniors and seniors. You can't help but learn if you're in that kind of situation. And I learned, I learned so many different things about them. So what I did was I set out and I studied every application folder of every child. So 325 kids times nine years divided by two. And one of the things I can tell you with great confidence is IQ scores were not the greatest predictor of success at that school. Now, it, I don't think they were irrelevant, but they were in a low average range. They were slight, they were moderate at best. And it was really a curved relationship. The lowest scores, the really low scores, relatively, kids struggled a little bit. And the super high scores, kids tended to do pretty well. But everybody in the middle was all over the place. That's several thousand data points. So you can't help but factor that into your thinking. How much weight do you want to put on that? There were other things in their lives that seemed to predict their success as students, at least, better. I want to tell you about a young woman named uh, Chandra Floyd, Dr. Chandra Floyd, just finished a dissertation at William and Mary, where she studied um, gifted ed coordinators in, in Virginia. And her lessons from that are just um, remarkable. If you would ever like to learn what it's really like to run gifted programs in a Southern state, please look up her dissertation. It'll change the way you think about it, in my opinion. It's a terrific work. Uh, Dr. Floyd is now an assistant professor at Kennesaw State University. She's a treasure to humanity. Um, recent studies we've done at the center, I just wanna mention a couple. One is a one person study. I had a series of, of interviews with a young woman who was a uh, 11th grader at a high school in Norfolk, Virginia. And we discussed her life in full as a gifted student. Uh, she was African-American child. If you had to summarize all the richness and all the texture and all that she described over these many hours, it was the responsibility of a gifted child is to serve her community. Now that is a fascinating metaphor for what giftedness means in terms of responsibility. Fast forward, we published a paper just a few couple years ago now, maybe less, where we talked about, inter we interviewed two different groups of gifted kids. Those who were from our, our programs that were affluent in terms of the kids who attended them or middle-class and upper middle-class kids and then the children who attended our programs that are of the most modest means financially. And we heard two different sets of values being articulated. The students who came from the, the, the families with lower incomes, again, they talked about giftedness as the responsibility for their communities to develop their abilities and their talents so they can contribute back to society period, full stop. The interviews with the other children really startled me because they were quite different than what I learned when I interviewed kids back in the 80s. We did hundreds and hundreds of interviews with children from governor schools programs who tended to load heavy on being white, upper middle class. From then to now, the biggest change I saw was those children we served from the more financially affluent families was, they don't have the affinity for their teachers that they used to. They're not often satisfied with what the teachers are doing for them. And their primary purpose for gifted education is to land a high paying job. Now, now I don't, I'm not gonna try to generalize these results of, across all situations, but these are powerful messages. And in the second paper, we talked about poverty of a different kind. This, this feeling that so many of those students had from the more affluent schools, that their teachers were just uh, in their way most of the time and not helping them with this fairly narrow cause. 
Their cause was not to contribute back to society, was not to do good for their community. It was about high paying jobs. Wow, that's something we need to think about. That is poverty of a different kind. So myself, how I'm grappling with this, how I'm trying to make sense of it, what possibly I can do, is we are trying to take this notion that Larry Coleman and I came up with some years ago called a school-based conception of giftedness. And we're trying to come up with a conception of giftedness that gives equal value to all children. All children have potential talents and abilities. Some of them may be endowed with some greater potential at birth or through opportunity and advantage. How do I know that? Well, my twin boys, when they were born, by the time they got to kindergarten, my wife and I had read over 12,500 books to them. So their receptive language skills were off the chart. They couldn't be measured because they had heard all of these words spoken over and over. I still walk with a limp because of the book Hop on Pop. I read Hop on Pop to my sons hundreds of times, which meant after every version, it had to end in a wrestling match. Well, when they were two and three years old, I could usually take them in two or three falls. But when they got to be eight or 10 years old and there were four instead of two, dear old dad took a pretty bad beating year in and year out. Well, that kind of advantage is something we have to take into account, opportunities. So I'm excited by the movement. I'm excited by the leaders, the leaders, uh, Dr. Davis, Dr. Chow, the ones mentioned uh, group that uh, Gilman mentioned and showed the picture of. I know a lot of those fine people. Some of the people here who are writing, uh, um, as, you know, about the event tonight. There are so many fine leaders who are representing the the way of thinking about things differently. That I'm optimistic in a different way than I was. For me personally, we are. We now have a third version of this old school-based conception of giftedness, but it's I'm flying the flag of talent development now because I, to me, I can make room for everybody who wants to be there, teachers, students, the resources, my belief about assessment often being uh, separated from actual goals of gifted programs. If you do many program evaluations, you know immediately one of the most common problems is we say we're going to do this in gifted ed, then we use the instruments that don't have anything to do with that. Uh, that's existed for as long as we've had gifted programs. It hasn't gone away, surprisingly. So I'm trying to make sense out of this through a talent development flag. I feel pretty good about it because we can take a lot of the resources that are expensive in trying to determine whether a person's gifted and put them in the developmental processes and procedures that might help them become gifted. I like that idea. I think there's success there for an awful lot of kids who otherwise might not have opportunities. Now, I'm not trying to convince you of anything. It's just that I'm so fortunate that I get paid to think about and worry about these things I landed in a field where I could sit and talk with gifted kids for five hours a day. And I have colleagues like this who can challenge me and tell me when my ideas are wrong. One of the greatest minds in the field that I want everybody who's a part of this tonight to remember and maybe do a little homework in is a woman named Mary Frazier. Now, Mary and I weren't friends per se. I aspired to be her friend, but we just did not cross paths enough before she passed away. I had a wonderful conversation with her years ago, and we were sitting at a table after an event at NAGC. And I, I don't think Mary would mind me telling you the story, but she had a theory about truly gifted that she thought was a particularly problematic way of thinking about giftedness. It allowed for all sorts of untoward behavior, she thought. And one of the things I loved about Mary was in spite of me just getting to know her. Now she was close friends with my mentor, Larry Coleman. So that introduction, I think got me a little bit of uh, respect from her. So at one point she's, she's, getting, she's getting very solemn as she tells me these stories about children she's working with and how they're always, the black kids, as soon as you just hint at changing the identification problem, procedures, then you just get lambasted with this notion that you're lowering standards to let in kids who aren't truly, truly gifted. So she's really getting upset, getting teary-eyed. 
and I'm getting teary eyed. And then just out of the blue, she grabs a wig that she's wearing because of her illness. She was struggling with cancer and was, was having chemotherapy and all. So she grabs her wig and pulls it off her head and just throws it on the table and cursed a little bit around that and said, like that wig, it just doesn't feel right. Well, 30 years later, look at her history, look at her effects. She's one of those people that I don't think we give enough credit to, but my goodness, was she insightful about things we can be doing. And she had these ideas 30 and 40 years ago. So there's a critical mass. We can make these improvements. We can serve more kids. We can do a better job at it, but we've got to rethink and perhaps let go some of the conventions that have framed us or kept us within the frame that Gil alluded to. At least that's what I'm taking from all this. And I do recognize, while I don't like the sayer, I like the saying, I beseech you in the bowels of Christ to believe it possible you might be mistaken. Well, I have learned I am mistaken a lot, but I, I sure give it hell. I do my best to think about these things and thank God for doctoral students because they're a really good re reminder on a regular basis how wrong a professor can be. And, and our students at William & Mary have done some tremendous research in the last, well, since I've been there, last 12 years that I would really encourage you to look at because it's, it's shining a light on some of these things that will help guide us as we struggle to improve the conditions. So thank you all very much for letting me, uh, I don't know, wring my hands for a while. Norma, I hope you don't mind. Gil, thank you very much. Dr. Davis, Dr. Chow, it's been an honor to be on this panel with you. And for anyone who listened tonight, I appreciate your attention and your goodwill. Thank you very much. Fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. Thank you so very, very much. Tracy, I, I want to say thank you for encouraging us to think of tests as a way to help learn about children. Thank you. And for giving us homework about Mary Fraser. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. Let's all do our homework about Mary Fraser. Thank you for your approach this evening. Stephen, thank you for the charge. Are we moved enough to make change? Let's carry forward that charge. Joy, your wisdom, of it's about the children and we need to do what is humane and moral. You are so right. Thank you so much. And Gil, thank you for the Frederick Douglass quote. If there is no struggle, there's no progress. Thank you for your inspiration. And yes, let us go forward to serve as guideposts. So thank you, Dr. Whiting, Drs. Cross, Lawson Davis, and Chow, to our alumni, and Tracy, to quote you, thank God for graduate students, to our Emerald and Ruby sponsors, and most of all, thank you to each of our attendees. We are grateful for your commitment to all gifted and talented students and their families, to those who educate and serve. Let us all go make the world a better place. Amen. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for your comments, everybody. Appreciate it. Oh, I like that. Put that John Connor uh, uh, Lewis back up there. That was a cool little uh, thing there, you see it? There we there go. There it is. Good yeah, trouble. That's, I like Good that. Trouble. Yeah. Good trouble. I like that. Sharp. Well, thank you all. Uh, Stephen, thank you for your comments. I don't know if you all can still hear me. Steve, uh, Tracy, and Joy, thank you all for your comments. They're really, they're really interesting. It was a weird thing sitting here. It was like, uh, you know, you talk and you have somebody comment on it. I was, I, this is a weird kind of thing, but I appreciate what you said. And I heard every word that you said, and it only made me want to work with all of you. All that made me want to say, oh, we need to write something. Oh, I like what he said, I like what she said. Of course, Joy, we're always trying to do, do good things and bad things together uh, in terms of getting uh, people to see things differently. So the, the biggest problem, of course, we all run into is that we're speak, speaking to each other who's already trying to make the moves towards the same direction. 
and getting it to the, the administrators and teachers. And that's why what Trace was talking about doing in, in my work up in Minnesota, work with those uh, teachers and principals and, and administrators. I think those are the people who actually are on the ground and have to work and do that thing every day. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Have a wonderful evening. We look forward to working together again and to seeing you all in the future. Good night. Have a good night. Ciao. Good night.